Then I think about what's unfolding in Japan today. I sense something grave is happening. I have heard many Fukushima people's personal accounts of their family members or friends dying suddenly. In one case, a baby suddenly died. And these illnesses and sudden death are not just happening only in Fukushima prefecture. People are sicker in Tokyo. And it's not just people who are sicker. I met a home gardener who lives in Kawamata, Fukushima, 30 miles from Fukushima Daiichi. And she grows loofahs, whose fruit is often dry to make um, bath sponges. Last year, with some trepidation, she used the seeds saved from the year before. She found flower buds directly growing out of the fruit. And some of her pole beans were abnormally gigantic. Near Fukushima City, another person saw a frog so severely deformed that at first it was difficult to tell that it was a frog, save for its hopping. These are true events described by people I met who took notes and photographs of these environmental anomalies. During my month-long stay in Japan in December and January, I too experienced unusual symptoms. I developed a skin rash that doesn't heal. When I was in Fukushima, I developed a scratchy throat and pain in my eyes. Something is happening, and yet we cannot prove anything. The IAEA and Fukushima Medical University are working together to collect and collate the health data of Fukushima residents. Many residents fear that this effort is just a show, or worse yet, just for the sake of collecting secret data. Many people fear that the experts already have a foregone conclusion. The conclusion that if people get ill, it's not because of the Fukushima Daiichi disaster. As of December last year, of the 254,280 young Fukushima people who were 18 years old or younger at the time of the power plant catastrophe, 74 were found to either have thyroid cancer or are suspected of having thyroid cancer. 33 of these children have already needed and gone through surgery. There are different statistics for the rate of thyroid cancer among children prior to the Fukushima Daiichi disaster. Some say 1 to 2 in 1 million. Others say 17 in 1 million. Compared to either of them, the current number in Fukushima is staggering. Disturbingly, the Japanese and the international radiation experts continue to maintain that these thyroid cancers are not related to the Fukushima Daiichi disaster. The same pattern is repeated over and over. How long will this pattern continue? Many Japanese people are confronted by different choices they have to make each day. Whether or not to wear a mask, whether or not to move with the children from their home to a less contaminated area, whether or not to buy the spinach that may contain cesium, whether or not to eat fish because now it's known that huge amounts of strontium-90 are pouring into the Pacific Ocean from Fukushima Daiichi. But the most important choice of our lives was never available to any of us. We were not allowed to choose whether or not we wanted to accept all the unearthed uranium and the resulting radionuclides in our lives. The Fukushima Daiichi disaster opened the door for me to see how this is 
not a mere Japanese crisis. It's a crisis that transcends geography and time. What can we do now? Sometimes a big part of me feels the situation is too late to remedy. This is a situation mired with the world politics and economy, the struggle for power and money. It's hard to stop the march of heavily armed people with a prayer. But I dare say every life is sacred, no matter how small it is. <laughs>